Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today we have uh, John Cameron, the uh, author of Rewire, Rekill, and Aristocracy, as well as a development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation, along with Jason McPhee, uh, an engineer for the state of California. The uh, Defense Authorization Act was uh, finally signed here recently. It, it funds, well, tell us what it funds, Jason, and how much it's going to cost us. Well, it looks like it's going to cost us over seven hundred billion dollars, uh, and that's spending. what per person, something like two it's or three over thousand. two thousand dollars per, per person, person per every man, woman, and child in yeah. the country. Essentially, yeah. we have over three hundred million people, but it's you know you divide that out, and it's about two thousand dollars per person. Yeah. So, yeah, and you think about what we could do with all that kind of uh, spending, and it's uh, you know it's uh, it's sad that we keep funding uh, a. a world police force essentially <laughs> so you know that was one of the uh, I guess the the big missed moments it seemed you know Ron Paul years back when he ran uh, you know for the uh, Republican ticket tried to make the case uh, to everybody that you know we can pull back and, and not spend so much policing the world and we still haven't learned that lesson yet that's why even Barry Goldwater warned mm -hmm. no, no, Eisenhower, Eisenhower former general yeah, yeah, warned, uh, warned complex. about the military industrial complex because it's not you know if if it was uh, funding defense um, you know that'd be fine but it's funding offense we still have troops in I don't know how many hundreds of countries not counting the Marines that are in every well I mean um, they, all you have to do is look at Afghanistan the longest war we've ever been in and mm -hmm. we're still losing uh, Longer than Vietnam? Vietnam is a shorter war than Afghanistan yeah. at this point, yeah. yeah. And uh, we're helping the Saudis uh, massacre people in Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm talking about war crimes. We're, mm -hmm. you know, they're using American munitions to uh, basically wipe the country out. Uh, all because the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia don't like the Shia in Iran who mm -hmm. is backing the, the, the Yemenis. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, and, uh, you know, a ridiculous increase in the uh, debt of the United States, which we simply cannot afford. The only people who are making out are the defense contractors. The, it used to be the military-industrial complex. It's now the military-industrial-security-intelligence uh, complex. That's just on, on, the, uh, on the defense side. Well, and the sad thing is this kind of spending just begets more spending because as we go there and people see us, shaking hands with horrific people, you know, shaking hands with the likes of Saddam Hussein and the dictator after dictator, you know, it, it, it brings into question America's moral stances and, and, and tars us with, you know, uh, uh, you know, I guess a lot of, uh, you know, bad uh, people assuming that we have bad intentions on a lot of things, so. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the droner in chief, I refer to Barack Obama, mm. at least had the good sense not to do photo ops with dictators. Uh, our current president does photo ops and, 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 uh, and joint press conferences and backslapping with the, the likes of Duterte of the Philippines, who is a butcher, uh, not to mention Putin in the Soviet Union or in, the, in Russia. So uh, we, we have a, a, a situation where we are uh, overtly partnering with people who are not good guys. Mm. and. Uh, we are also engaging now in trade wars that very easily, look at Taft-Hartley and the, and the build-up to World War II, could lead to a shooting war not just in the Middle East or not just in, uh, in, in Afghanistan or places where, we're, where we've been doing it for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. I want to, I want to just ask the, the audience and you guys both uh, this question. If the, if the Soviet Union decided to attack um, uh, people that they viewed as uh, terrorists on United States soil with a drone attack and American civilians were killed, what do you think would be the reaction of the American people um, to that? Well, it would be all out war against, against Russia. Okay, Thank so you. we um, do this in multiple countries multiple times a year over and over again and wonder why so many people around the, the planet hate us. Sure. Well, and, 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 and why they don't fight back? The only reason they don't fight back is because we have such overwhelming force. Our military is six times larger than the next, or is, is larger than the next, I think it's ten uh, countries combined. Mm -hmm. uh, we have such overwhelming force that we can, at least for the time being, mm -hmm. afford or get by with being the bully on the planet. Well, and then also we're not, it's not like we're attacking China. It would be, a, you know, a different thing. We, yeah. we take on, you know, maybe we can bomb Afghanistan forward into the Stone Age because the country 
you know, what are you going to attack? I mean, yeah. it's, it's, and why are we there? You know, yeah, maybe they're training terrorists. You know, if you want to be the world's policeman, why weren't you um, dropping the 82nd Airborne into Africa when 600,000, was it Hutus? Hutus, Hutus were and, slaughtered yeah, Hutus and Hutus. Uh, in the course of weeks, uh, hacked to death with machetes. Um, even in, in, you know, quasi-Europe, in, in Croatia and Serbia and all the rest of that, Instead of putting American troops on the ground, we basically bomb civilians to get people to the peace table. So, I mean, we're, um, if any other country in the world did what we do under the guise of being a peacekeeper, uh, we would drag them into, um, into a war crimes court. And, um, and, 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 and for the people who say, you know, libertarians are soft on defense, mm -hmm. they, we would uh, somehow or another uh, lose to the demonic forces of other countries. Mm. Well, I have good news for you. We've got two moats on either side of the country. They're called the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, which make a land invasion uh, almost impossible because you'd have to either come through the tundra of Canada or go through Mexico and neither uh, the desert of Mexico and neither one makes for a very uh, successful land invasion. Mm. The United States, for all practical purposes, is impregnable impregnable from, uh, from military attack, uh, conventional or unconventional. Now, but our nuclear, interests, our interests, um, Richard, we have to our pursue interests our interests. Our financial interests are something that when, uh, whenever ExxonMobil or any other co company goes to a dicey area to go to business uh, in partnership with, say, the Saudis or the Iraqis or the uh, Russians, whoever it is, it's on them to take the risk. It's not on us to protect their commercial interests. Sure, when this is this is part of what makes us, you know, people question our motives too, when they see us over there as, you know, our military helping to extract resources from another country and, you know, why not just let the market do what it does and, you know, these people want to sell those resources and they, they will. deal directly. I guarantee you, they will. I mean, sure. But, you know, one point that you mentioned earlier and I think, it, uh, you know, just to, to hammer it home is, you know, Bastiat, I believe, was the one who said, you know, when when uh, uh, goods cross borders, then you know armies won't. And the rhetoric that we've been getting is exactly in the opposite direction. I mean, we're, we're, our rhetoric is to restrict goods from crossing borders and start building up our military, and that just does seem a little bit scary. Yeah, we're, we're, we're shooting across borders as opposed to trading across borders. Not a good idea. Who said that? Basti? I Bastiat. believe it was Bastiat. Bastiat. Yeah. I um, like this Bastiat. And of course, a whole lot of people are becoming independent. The uh, numbers of people who are uh, registered Democrats or registered Republicans has been going down for years. It's going down even faster now. Uh, a whole lot of elections are being won by libertarians and by socialists. And Republicans and Democrats are starting to switch to the Libertarian Party. What's up, what's up with that? Uh, the 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 creep of rational thought into people's processes. What what happens is I think people um, go into um, government thinking that 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 their party is somehow different. That they they as a Republican are radically different from from their enemy, the Democrat. And then when they get into the swamp, whether it's the swamp at a state house or the swamp in in, in D.C. Um, they realize that, that the problem, you know, basically is that uh, with, you could put those two parties like this and, and have trouble getting a razor blade in between them, except for on some litmus issues that they use to raise money, like, uh, you know, right to life or freedom of choice, or I guess it would be freedom of, yeah, right to life, freedom of choice, right and left. Um, they're really, they're, they're really all the same. Um, and, and it's uh, government incursion, government control, government program, government spending, taxation. And um, these are the things that, that once you get in there and look around, you realize this just isn't working. And, and my party, for example, if you're a Republican, you know, the Republican Party used to stand for fiscal constraint. You know, one time it, it stood for um, uh, near isolationism from a military standpoint. But let's go trade. Let's not, you know, let's not. Um, Taft Republican. Yeah. yeah. And then the Democrats uh, supposedly stood for um, um, social freedom. 
You know, like uh, they, they uh, the individual rights. Civil liberties. And civil liberties. But now... Uh, Not so much anymore. Civil liberties <laughs> are only uh, favored by the Democratic Party if you're in agreement with them. Right now we have we have the the, the uh, specter of Republicans, the supposed free trade party, being anti free trade, and the Democrats being free trade just be just because just because the Republicans aren't, mm. and for no other reason. We're looking at tribal warfare between Democrats and Republicans, wanting to keep their tribe in power to, so that they have first access to the uh, the tax booty. That's what's going on, and. It's kind of under the radar so far uh, that you know honest politicians who get elected uh, as Democrats or Republicans are moving to the Libertarian Party, but it's happened. It's happening mostly at the city council level, mm -hmm. at the county commissioner level, but it's also starting now to happen at the state legislative level. A little bit. Level. Yeah, yeah. We saw three state legislators in uh, New Hampshire: one Democrat, two Republicans, switch from uh, their respective parties to the Libertarian Party and form a Libertarian caucus. And I, the, uh, the, the situation I'd like to highlight this evening is one in Nebraska. They have a unicameral legislature, uh, one house, uh, it's a Senate, and Senator Laura Epke was elected as a Republican. And she said, you know, the Republicans don't care about civil liberties anymore. They don't care about overspending anymore. I am going to switch my allegiance, I'm going to switch my voter registration, switch my party from Republican to Democratic. She did so. And uh, as a uh, libertarian senator from the state of Nebraska, she was successful in getting through the legislature a massive uh, reform bill, reforming the uh, Nebraska's practice of, of, of uh, over licensing mm -hmm. of, uh, of trades. I mean, they were licensing trades that absolutely should not have been licensed in the first place because there's no possible reason other than to protect the people who are already in those trades. Uh, she was able to get that through as as a um, as tripartisan legislation. She got Democratic votes, Good she got her. Republican votes, and she got her own vote, of, of course. And uh, as a result, the Republicans they were gunning for her. The Republican governor of of, uh, of Nebraska, as well as uh, the uh, the uh, the fund the, the you know the Republican funded uh, opponents in the primary, the jungle primary, a top two, similar to California's. They put lots of money trying to make sure that she did not make the top two. She did. She's up for re-election come, come November. So libertarians are not only making the switch, they are successfully convincing their constituents that what they are doing is in the public interest and is in their interest and is in the interest of the, of the state or, or country, as, as the case may be. It's kind of funny, too, because uh, you mentioned that they were trying to sort of stack the deck against her a little bit, you know, there. and. and and it, you know we've seen this happen in the last few presidential elections when, when Ron Paul looked like he was doing good, they, they you know they, they kind of changed the rules on him <laughs> during the process, yeah. and when Bernie Sanders looked like he was starting to make a move, you know then the the Democrats sort of rigged the game against him. So it, it's well, yeah, and we saw it in, in 2016. We saw it against the uh, Libertarian presidential candidate. Uh, 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 Gary Johnson. Sure. Gary was doing uh, uh, polled, I think, at his highest about 13 percent. As soon as and and and, the, and Hillary Clinton's pollster said, "Hey, he's taking your millennial vote. You need to do something. You need to you need to stop nip this in the bud." So they, uh, Democratic operatives and Democratic PACs, threw a boatload of money, uh, negative campaigning against Gary Johnson. It worked. They he made the mistake of not immediately recognizing. Uh, a city in Syria that nobody's ever heard of, including him. Uh, but uh, you know, so he, he helped them along a little bit. But it was a, it was a whole lot of money thrown at him uh, it, during the summer of 2016 that that, uh, that made life difficult for for the Johnson campaign, which still got a record number of votes, almost uh, four uh, four and a half million, uh, a record number of votes for a libertarian presidential candidate. It also got him 10 percent, nearly 10 percent of the vote for president in New Mexico. And just a couple of days ago, uh, he decided to run for Senate in New Mexico. Now, just a little bit of background. Aubrey, uh, uh, I forget his last name, uh, Aubrey Dunn had already been selected by the Libertarians to be the Libertarian senatorial nominee. But when Aubrey looked at the polling on a matchup between him and the Democratic uh, incumbent, and Gary Johnson against the Democratic incumbent, he said to Gary, 
Yeah, you know what? I think I'm gonna. I think I think you would make a better candidate. You would have a better chance of actually winning this race. So I'm gonna drop out. I would encourage you to take my place. Gary Johnson took a look at it and said, "Hey, this is not going to be a 12-year race or a four-year race or a, you know, a long, drawn-out campaign. This is going to be a nine-week race. I can do that. I can run this this sprint." Mm -hmm. And he said, "I'm going to do this." He is now running for Senate against a. Uh, a first-time Republican who's never run for public office before uh, on the uh, Republican side, a one-term uh, Democrat who's got soft support. So there's a very, very good chance that uh, we could have a trilateral or a, tri, uh, a, tri a tripartisan Senate come 2000, uh, 2019. That's, that's what we have to look forward to. And I, I tell you, he is running this time as a libertarian there as well. Absolutely, right? running as a libertarian, absolutely. And you know, they, they, this is, I guess, the real test because the people of New Mexico should know him very well. I mean, yeah, two-term governor. Exactly, and so they appear to be happy. He governed as a libertarian, even though he was a Republican. Exactly. So I mean, this is a real test to see, you know, if, if the power of the two-party, you know, label is is the all-important determination because here he's going to be running with a record in a place where people like him. So. You know, if he can win as a libertarian, that'll be a, a great thing. It'll be a milestone. And he's winning, or he's running in a state where 22% of the electorate is registered independent. Mm -hmm. So you've got a 22% uh, group of people who don't like the Democrats or the Republicans. You've got conservative uh, Hispanics who uh, are expected to vote, you know, toe the line, vote Democrat, but probably won't when they actually get into the privacy of the voting booth, and Republicans who are fed up with the overspending of the uh, Republican Party in Washington. So, I, you know, this, how this, he, this how is, is a, it's a winnable. Do we know? Too, too he, early, too early to tell. Too early? Okay. But I, I can tell you that their internal polls were good enough for him to say, this is worth running, and I am not interested in running unless I think I can win. Mm -hmm. So. Good enough so that he can win. He's running as an underdog, but as an underdog, who's got a shot. Well, and hopefully the people of New Mexico will have enough sense to not be swayed by the fact that he, you know, that there was the Aleppo issue. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, it, quite yeah, frankly, and, and that and was Obama that. said 53 states that he'd campaigned in. I mean, everybody makes a, a faux pas on the campaign trail. The, the Democrats were able to throw enough money at it to make it stick. That's well, what happened. You know, to me, it, it actually says something a, a little bit good about uh, uh, Johnson, the fact that he had trouble with that question, because it means he's not thinking about going to war over there, whereas uh, the reason why everybody else knew where that was is because they were all thinking about bombing over and, there. And, and I, think, I think, quite frankly, that one of the things they, they, they didn't do was have a strong political operative on their team who could have done, taken that, his lack of information on it when they pointed it out and, and helped him spin it, yeah. um, which is basically say, yeah, you know, my concern is with the American people and things that happen inside yeah. the border and our, um, you know, that's my focus. If these other people want to focus on waging war on poor people in other countries and being experts on, on how we're wasting American young men's lives there, then I'll let them be the expert on that. But I'll promise you as president that I will that not get you into a war in Syria get you in the first place. Place. Where you have to and know in where the second Aleppo place, is. I'll do a hell of a lot better job for you domestically. Yeah, yeah, and, I care more so about where you, you live than then, someplace else where yeah. we're going to drop and some bombs. So, <laughs> yeah, I think there were, there were some definite uh, missteps. In, yeah, he in focused on saying, hey, I'm an honest guy, I admit my mistakes, which yeah. is fine, yeah. but he, he should have gone on that. You, he, you, you know, you you know when, you're, when, you're, when you're running for president, what do they say, this, is, this, ain't, this ain't softball? No. No, no, it's or it's bean uh, ball or whatever. It's it's bean ball. Yeah. It's uh, with razor blades in it. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta be gotta be a little tougher than that. Yeah. In San Francisco, they are very, very uh, uh, concerned about the uh, the appearance of public streets. Mm -hmm. So much so that uh, well, they they have decided to form a, a poop patrol. Now you might think this is for uh, you know doggy bags, but mm -hmm. no, this is for the uh, human poop left by uh, people who are living on the streets of mm -hmm. San Francisco and don't have uh, public bathrooms to go to, I guess. Right, John? Well, uh, according to some people that I, I know who live in San Francisco, and I've had recent telephone converse, conversations with and occasional visits, that uh, San Francisco has an attitude toward um, even criminal behavior, much less homeless behavior, that is hands-off. They won't 
prosecute for a lot of crime. I, you know, it, it's almost as if in San Francisco, if you park your car on the street, it's like the, the Soviet Union during the downfall. You had to take your windshield wipers with you into your house because somebody would steal them. This is the kind of thing that's going on in, in San Francisco because they're not prosecuting um, crime and they're completely hands off on the homeless folks. Uh, other than the mayor, of course, wanting to uh, send out patrols to scoop these people up, get them off the streets, and get them registered under a federal program of disability, Social Security disability. But the the uh, the problem of, of uh, street homeless and the uh, excrement and dirt and all the rest of that on the street it supposedly was a reason that the uh, one of the major national conventions for medical. Uh, I think it might have been the AMA, canceled um, their convention in San Francisco and moved it elsewhere, supposedly with a financial impact to the city of $40 million. So uh, it's bad, and, and it's bad, it's self-created bad. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if people break the law, uh, whether they're homeless or live in a high-rise, the law needs to be re uh, applied equally. Well, and, yeah, let's not be too so, hard. Let's not be too hard on the homeless. Well, no, I'm, I mean, I'm not. Most of them are, are most of them are mentally ill, and I'm, well, yeah. not only that, but most of them can't afford a home in yeah. San Francisco uh, because absolutely. even the yeah. no, I agree. even, I even agree. middle income people can't afford a home. Well, uh, yeah. of course, they probably shouldn't be in San Francisco, and they wouldn't be in San Francisco but for the free uh, welfare services mm -hmm. that they get there, probably more so than in in. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Let's well, say. I'm, I'm, I must say, in, and I could be completely subjective on this, that, that the, the most aggressive, craziest homely pe homeless people uh, I have ever seen are in, they scare me. The, the ho I work in downtown uh, Sacramento, and there's homeless people all over the place. And compared to the people in, in San Francisco that I've seen, the people right outside the office that I work in are, are they could be in a choir in a church. I mean, the, the people in San Francisco that I've seen on the streets need help. They need help desperately. And uh, there's huge money in San Francisco. And, um, you know, the, I don't know who said it, but, but, but uh, a person said that the way you judge a society is, is how well it takes care of people who can't take care of themselves, not who won't not who choose not to work or choose not to um, move to find a job. But these people can't survive in the world that you and I survive in anywhere. They're just not capable. And, and surely this money machine that is all of the tax money being drained out of businesses, what is it, like a local tax of like 9% in San Francisco or something like that? I mean, it's outrageous. You could, you could care for these people. You could. And, and I think it's shameful that it's not happening. Well, and you know, this is part of the problem. You know, when you allow government to take that role, then a, a lot of times government doesn't do a very good job of mm -hmm. it. I mean, you're saying they're already taking the money to do different things, and apparently they're having to spend it on, instead of going after the root of the problem, they're cleaning up the poop. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> San Francisco creates a problem by making housing through zoning restrictions and building restrictions and the whole nine yards, making housing extremely unaffordable. Uh, they, they, they create the problem where people can't afford housing at any level. Uh, you know, talk about putting in a tiny home or a, a flop house a hotel, we can't do it uh, in, San, in San Francisco. It's, it's pretty much illegal. Uh, and so the, the, they create a, a supply problem as far as housing is concerned. They create a magnet by providing um, benefits for housing in the form of, of welfare services and so forth, so and the climate is nice, so they create a magnet for people to come there, who have no place to live once they get there besides the streets, and uh, the the licensing laws and the uh, the you know the, the impediments to employment are such that it's very difficult for even for even the most rudimentary blue collar person to get a job in San Francisco and, and all over California. Well, and here's one of the other interesting things. HUD puts out a, uh, a study every year on homelessness in America. And it's, you would think, living here in California, that it's going up everywhere, but it's not going up everywhere. It's going up in a lot of the, essentially, the blue state strongholds. So you look at California, New York, um, uh, Hawaii, of, of all places. And of course, you know, definitely a blue state. But 
it can't just be a migration problem because why would it be so high in Hawaii? You know, if, if you know, it's, it's certainly a long way for them to travel to get to Hawaii <laughs> if, if it's people going there for the weather or something mm -hmm. else. So, I, you know, it, it, obviously there's there's something going on in the blue states that's maybe driving a little bit of this a little more. Well, is it the same thing states. that's going on in Venezuela where uh, the uh, uh, socialism of uh, uh, the country has gone to the point where they have totally run out of other people's money and they can't even afford to keep uh, water flowing through, through the taps? Absolutely. Uh, Venezuela, talking about an ocean and, and Hawaii being far away, Venezuela is on supposedly the largest supply of oil in the world. Now, Bigger than Saudi they, Arabia. What's that? Bigger, Bigger than, than Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Now, admittedly, it needs a, it's it's dirty oil. It's high sulfur oil. But when it's ba bubbling out of the ground, in essence, um, then you add some costs to refining, and it's still wonderful. But you know that Venezuela nationalized the the uh, you know they had people in uh, from from Western oil companies, European oil companies, American oil companies producing oil. Uh, the, the economy was booming, the schools were good, and then um, socialist gets in place, they nationalize, uh, kick the, the people who knew what they were doing out, and uh, then they, they purged all the senior management in the national oil company repeatedly, where you have people who are great socialists but don't know anything about engineering and bringing out oil. You have Lake Maracaibo, uh, basically used to produce uh, it was a, a fishing lake, and now you can't fish in it because of oil leaks, because of the pipes they can't maintain. And it's gotten to the point now where people are, the stores are empty, you have hyperinflation, you have um, rioting in the streets, you have middle class people attacking supermarkets, you have... Um, and you have an immigration yeah. problem. Everybody's going to Colombia if they can get across the border. Mm -hmm. uh, big problem. Socialism doesn't work. Minnesota, a Somali immigrant by the name of Ilhan Omar won the primary for the Democratic uh, nod for, uh, the, uh, uh, for, for, for a seat in Minnesota. Uh, and she is somebody who would have been illegal to get into the state, uh, to even to, even to enter, enter the country under Trump's travel ban. Now she's probably going to go to Congress. Well, and, and this is, you know, I guess just puts an exclamation point on how silly our, our immigration laws have been for so long. Um, you know, it, under under a libertarian ideal, if somebody wants to come somewhere to work and somebody wants to hire them, you let them do that. You let them form that. And that for the record, libertarians have the most uh, forgiving uh, policy on open immigration of all three parties. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Libertarian kind of point on the uh, television at Channel 17 Sacramento. Cable channels all over the place at... Uh, uh, Facebook, at uh, YouTube, and on the web at www.accessing.com.